I'm Dr. Dees. Welcome to Health Center from Downstate Medical Center. Depression. It's very easy to get depressed. People have simple depression. Other people have a major depression. Uh, some people have to take medicines. Other get just psychiatric uh, counseling and things like that and improve. Medication is not always necessary, but and oftentimes it is. But uh, sometimes if you just use that as the first part of the therapy, it takes away the uh, potential of the patient using their own cells uh, and their family to work with their uh, mental illness. In Africa, for example, when a person has a mental illness, they go to the witch doctor. Now, when they go to the witch doctor, they don't just go by themselves or with their family. The whole community goes to the witch doctor with them. <laughs> and they have the greatest cure in Africa for mental illness on the basis of a community participation in taking care and seeing that patient as such and dealing with that patient over a period of time. Because when that patient goes back to the community, the com whole community knows that patient and therefore can do certain things that will keep that patient intact. Because there's nothing like being alone when you have mental illness or sitting alone or just having one therapist. You need the therapy of the whole community. And if you don't have that, all the psychiatric drugs, all the psychiatrists uh, can just take up their degrees and throw them away. And because basically, mental illness is not just a chemical illness, it's a social, mental, uh, spiritual illness. Uh, I was at a conference not too long ago uh, at Downstate Medical Center where psychiatrists were discussing depression. And I was the only black uh, person in that audience. And, uh, uh, this is in Brooklyn, of course, Downstate Medical Center. And Fulton Street is not far from here. I was raised in Brooklyn. I'm a Brooklyn Knight. And uh, uh, so I, uh, when a question and answers came up, or questions, I had to get up and tell them this. If I could put all you psychiatrists on a bus and drive you down two miles down Fulton Street, I'll show you who's taking care of psychiatric illness the storefront church. I could show you a hundred storefront churches that's taking care of mental illness without medicine as such. And because this, again, is a cultural thing, whether it's Spanish or African-American or Polish or uh, German or Japanese, everybody has a different group dynamics that makes a person sane because of the depressions that can come into a community can in cause insanity, causing you to do illness, things that are so outrageous that you go to prison and they never treated there either. So you have a double whammy there. You become insane from the things that are happening, the depressions that you go through, and at the same time be put in jail where the depression's even worse, and then they expect you to come out at a period of time and be a productive person. But we're going to talk about this kind of uh, depression here and what we're doing here at Downstate uh, Medical Centers. Mabel Lamonte here, who is one of the uh, organizers and one of the ones that are pushing this type of uh, therapy and uh, making it known to the community that this is one of the answers, possible answers to help those who have mental illness. I want to welcome you, Ms. Lamonte. Sure. Nice having you with Thank us. Thank you. Ms. Lamonte, I know that our own Folks might not have seen another show with, uh, with you here with me, but just a little, again, a little of your background of your, your injury uh, and what took place, maybe in just a couple of minutes, what, what brought you up, almost up to this point of doing what you're doing today. Sure. I sustained a motor vehicle accident and, um, no, I'm sorry, I was in a motor vehicle accident, sustained a spinal cord injury, C5 level, which, um, then I uh, went through seven months of rehabilitation. Um, after that, I got introduced to the occupational therapy. I decided to go into occupational therapy. I am currently um, a graduate from uh, Downstate. Mm -hmm. I'm working at Downstate in the Department of Psychiatry right. as an occupational therapist uh, for 18 years. 
And part of what I do that I love to do is that to introduce the patients that I'm working with to community resources, community support groups on the outside. Right. And I was informed of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Mm. But I didn't really know what the meeting would be about, so mm -hmm. I went myself to see what it was all about. Right. And from the first time that I went, I just loved it because Nash the NAMI, which stands for National Alliance on Mental Illness, is a nonprofit charitable organization. Okay. And its mission is the eradication of mental illness mm -hmm. and uh, improvement in the quality of life, both for the family and for the um, consumers, those that are affected by mental illness. Right. So um, there are many chapters in the boroughs, and within the chapters there are many affiliates. So the largest one in New York City is NAMI New York City Metro, and then we are NAMI East Flatbush Incorporated. We right. are the, one of the affiliates here in Brooklyn. Right. There are mm -hmm. others. There's NAMI April and there's another NAMI. But uh, we provide uh, support groups both for the family mm -hmm. and for the consumer here at Downstate. Um, the first Thursday of every month is for the consumer from 6 to 8 p.m. in Classroom 1B here in the Educational Building. And then for the family, the third Thursday every month from 6 to 8 p.m. in Classroom 1B. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing this for the past 12 years, right. but my involvement in it has been for the last eight years. Mm. Um, when I first started, I started uh, going to the family group. And within the family group, it was family, friends, and consumers. So it was a joint group. Oh. And then the consumers wanted a meeting on their own. They wanted to be able to discuss their issues. And so we decided to begin a group on their own. And so that's what I've been involved with since. Well, that's a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, when you think, you said in a very short time, <laughs> but it must have been a lot of things right. involved in this kind of thing for your uh, training to even be involved in this kind of thing or, or mm -hmm. to open it up to other community members. Um, if you hadn't had this injury, do you think you would ever gotten into this type of action that you're in today? Um, I probably, if I didn't have the accident, I probably would have been doing, become a sports trainer because that was my love then. <laughs> I was into um, sports and I was an aerobics instructor. So um, I don't know, I was, I was gonna probably pursue a degree in become a sports trainer, sports physiology or something like that, yeah. You know, it's amazing. So. Yeah. We use the word God, but we use the word power of goodness and uh, of the universe and things like this. We never know when the power of goodness changes our whole aspect mm -hmm. on life. Yes. You know, we, we, we just don't know. And, uh, uh, but we should never take it as something that's negative, uh, which you have done yeah. in a sense. And now up, up to the point where you had to take another degree in uh, mental health. Where did you achieve that at? Um, I'm doing that now at NIAC Alliance Graduate School of Counseling. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And do you think now that you will um, pursue that and or are you going to bring it all together, you know, with your work that you've been doing? I'm going to bring it all together. I'm also going to continue um, for my PsyD in uh, clinical psychology. PhD? And yes. 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 In clinical psychology? Yes. All right. Because I like psychological assessments, so you need to have a degree, like, uh, you need to have a PhD to be able to do psychological assessments. Right. So I want to be able to do that and do private practice, but within the private practice, I will always um, remember to address the consumer of mental health needs and also the family. That's why I'm happy for organizations like NAMI that um, just are there to provide advocacy, education, support. Yes. You know, um, the the family members carry such a, a tremendous burden. They don't know, yes. first of all, they get the news that their child has schizophrenia yeah. or bipolar. They don't know what to do. It's like, wh what is this? Who, you're giving them another diagnosis. And so that in itself is a, is something to deal with. It's a blow, you know? It they, is. they might blame themselves. They don't know how they got it, and so yeah. it's a matter of providing them the support that they need at the time that they get the news. Yes. You know, whether it's a form of education, it's a form of introducing them to other families who've gone through the same thing, and perhaps they can 
help each other. Surely, surely. So, I mean, you know, I'm just happy for NAMI, and it, it's there, and it, it shows that it works, too. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Well, you know, <coughs> uh, <coughs> during my practice, of 42 years, I went to Downstate here, came here in 1958 as a student, when there's two, only two African Americans in my class, and uh, um, why I'm saying this is because we need a dearth of African American people going into medicine, psychiatry, and all these kind of things because cultures are so different in each culture. I mean, the, the belief systems and things like this, you know. And so I really feel that uh, medicine has to introduce students into this kind of attitude also, even if they're going to be doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, your field would be so important for them to have a course here a in their curriculum mm -hmm. dealing with the things we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm because they come out, they do not have the same kind of uh, um, introduction and need of, uh, of, of therapy, you know, and other than just the medicines and the different chemicals that people use, you know. So basically, uh, how you, you want to form, I understand, an organization outside of even your work schedule, uh, there will be an independent organization that you want to start. What's the basis of that, uh, the theory behind what you're going to do there? If, if after I graduate, it's going to be part of a, I would like to do something like a wellness center. A wellness center? Yeah. Okay. And actually uh, introduce people. While, while you're doing the, while you're involved in the wellness center, I want to incorporate my experience as an occupational therapist, but also, um, my experience with NAMI, I, I really, really am so happy that uh, our um, our residency training program here for psychiatry. Yes. The um, the residents are involved in community mental health, okay. and they understand and respect, and they see highly how their um, patients that they see on the outside as an outpatient, mm. how they can be helped. A lot of them have told me stories that when they introduce both the consumer or the family to these support groups, that it does help. So I'm thinking that um, since we've been involved in um, uh, a yearly community walk, mm. part of what I really love that can still be included in like, let's say my wellness program is to remind people that it's so important to take care of not just your mental health, but your physical health as well. Right. And part of Part of that is something that we do every spring. The National Alliance on Mental, Ill, uh, on Mental Illness always has this yearly uh, fundraiser walk, and it's really there to raise awareness and to help to stamp out the stigma on mental illness. And our residency training program, our occupational therapy program, uh, medical students, and the consumers and family members of NAMI, right. East Flatbush, we've always put together a NAMI walk um, walk team here right. that oh. represents Downstate, but also uh, metabolic screening uh, oh, syndrome okay. booth. And what it is is because when people are taking medications, like you were addressing depression, sure. when people are taking medications, sometimes they puts them at risk for diabetes, right. for cholesterol, high cholesterol levels, right. and hyper, uh, become hypertensive. Yes. So our doctors and medical students and occupational therapy students at the booth, we screen them. We take their sugar levels, their weight, and um, their blood pressures, oh. and then we um, educate them mm -hmm. uh, about their results, yeah. and then we give them literature, and if they need a referral, there's a lot of free clinics. Oh, so okay. if they don't have insurance, we give them a referral to free clinics, and even our own Brooklyn Free Clinic that Downstate um, has okay. and runs. So. Um, together with that, we've been doing this for the last eight years, and it's really been a success. That's wonderful. Uh, how many people um, usually participate, oh, generally? Um, in oh. terms of the team? On, on numbers of people. Oh, there's, we amount. have at least over, over 30. We have over 30. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this year is even larger. Right. Yeah, right. which has been really great. Right. And Suzanne White, I think she's been on your show before. She right. was really a big part of... Um, joining forces, helping on uh, NAMI, East Flatbush join forces with our psychiatry mm. residency training program. Oh, that's Department great. Of psychiatry. So she was really a big, um, a big key person there. And 
Um, they've been supportive. The Department of Psychiatry has been very supportive of telling their clients mm -hmm. um, that they see on the outside the patients to come to NAMI, that there are supports there. And even most recently, I, um, I was hoping that one of the doctors would have been here on the show with us, um, but Dr. Putachanda just recently told me a story about he was um, um, treating a patient who is Spanish speaking I see. and was informed that we also have a Spanish speaking um, NAMI support group that's held at Keynes County. Oh, so you great. can actually reach out to the Spanish speaking client and the family members. That's what, you know, um, I'm a great one. Uh, when I was in school as a kid, I used to be kind of a clown and to make others laugh, <laughs> would get in trouble. I got a D in conduct for making people laugh. <laughs> so, but I've been laughing ever since anyhow, mm -hmm. and uh, laughter, you know, it's such a therapeutic modality that people it don't is. understand. In India, they actually have laughing clubs mm. where uh, they get up in the early morning hours and in circles and parks, hold hands and start laughing. And the laughter is not just ha, ha, ha. It's a deep laughter. No, uh, uh, Norman Cousins, who was a... Uh, had a lower back, terrible lower back pain, things like this. He would lock himself in a room and put on films of Laurel and Hardy and all these kind of uh, comics and laugh and laugh. And it would, in an hour or so, the pain would be relieved. Because the laughter of shaking the body, he called when you laugh real hardy, <laughs> like that, it releases endorphins which are the most potent pain-killing things in your body. It's more potent than morphine mm -hmm. as such. And uh, so laughing, uh, and so somebody would start laughing and everybody would start laughing. Well, it's just like when you go down to Coney Island, they used to have a place where you get in a little cart and it would take you through this dark thing. And uh, outside, it would be laughing. And by the time you got out of this thing, you were, you were laughing not realizing that the impact of laughter, the energy in laughter is so much different than the energy in crying, mm -hmm. for example, you know. But you can laugh until you cry, when you think about it. Yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> You've done that. <laughs> Where tears come down, you're just yeah. laughing. You can imagine for the lacrimal glands to release all of these tears, mm -hmm. and these tears have a lot of uh, all these antibodies and things in it and so forth, you might be getting rid of a lot of bad antibodies <laughs> at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. And so laughter is such a, have you ins thought of instituting laughter in a program that you're doing now with, uh, with even depression and things like that? We have that, we provide one of the colleagues that I work with, Michael Mintz, he's a rec therapist, and uh, he does a humor group upstairs on the unit. A humor group. Yes. Oh. And he actually does things. He either will do the funnies, he'll show videos on like Laurel Hardy or Lucille, uh, uh, Lucille <laughs> Ball, Ball yeah, or right. different ones, or he'll actually um, has a book on um, riddles or funnies or something. So he does incorporate that. Yeah, it's actually one of the reasons why it's one of the therapeutic groups that actually is helpful. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you talk about therapeutic groups, you really have to think of their culture or uh, what makes them mm -hmm. uh, depressed or things like this too. Sure. Because everyone doesn't have to even the same religion. Uh, when somebody's praying three times a day, uh, that's not the average uh, Christian praying three times a day, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the Muslim may be. Mm -hmm. or, the, uh, or all the other religions that are uh, storefront religions and th things that are, it has the basic God or uh, leaders within the group um, that form that particular religion, but still they have to be approached different ways because one thing might not relate to make that person respond to something else of another person's or, or, um, theology. Right. And so uh, basically you're using Christianity in yours. Uh, at the same time, I imagine you run into, or, or do you run into many folks who are Muslims who have the same or depression, and how do you approach those groups of people? I think there's a lot of, um, in our training for cultural competence, you really need to find out 
the um, culture of the individual, find right. out what what actually they believe in, how to approach them, as you were saying, and respect. Number one, you have to really respect where they're coming from and try and see what, what the needs are and what are the things actually to get to the core of what the things that are making them depressed yeah. and actually treating that because there's always a precipitant, there's always something at the core of what's triggering the depression. Right. And then finding out um, how is it affecting their ability to function mm. uh, independently or in the community or is it affecting interests, is it affecting the way that they care for themselves. Yes. And then address that and sometimes when you address a basic need is that, um, you're actually helping to help them build self-confidence, self-esteem again and sure. they're, they're back to feeling well along with the medication that the doctor prescribes if necessary. Right. You know, I think that this kind of group should also go into prisons where they treat, where they might think they're treating. When you talk about solitary confinement and all the things they put people through, if you're not depressed, you sure get depressed when you get into that prison system, which uh, Dr. Marabo showed uh, that it's definitely that your culture and the things that have happened in your neighborhood and things like this uh, all add up to that human experience. And if you don't recognize that human experience or be aware of it, some of the, all the training you can do with a person could be not because they have to go back to that same community. Mm -hmm. So this group that you're talking about, it's a more of a community-oriented thing, isn't it? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's what's interesting now is that NAMI's expanded its horizons on also having a faith net okay. part. So now it's reaching out to the churches as well. So you can oh. reach out all kinds of denominations and educate them on the importance of spirituality yes. and how um, that could be helpful in recovery of mental illness. You know, I, in Brooklyn, I have a list of churches in Brooklyn, just mm -hmm. Christian churches, not Catholic, just churches, thousands, literally thousands from the storefronts to cathedrals in, just in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. <laughs> where your organization could play a major role in connecting this kind of connection, because I'm sure in every one of those churches, there's people dealing with a child or a relative or a spouse that has a mental condition. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're gonna do in uh, getting your PhD and all the other things, you know, people are, are really, look like they need alphabets behind your name for you to, to do something important, <laughs> whether it's a PhD or a master's in this or a master's in that. But it's really the, uh, what you're doing is coming from that soul and heart of your own experience that you can make people re respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so important. Like when I think about having been through my tragedy, I could have been chosen to be depressed. Surely. And maybe just God just gave me the strength to go through this, but how many others that I've seen, you know, even as a result of the tragedies that are affected and they either, they have a loss and they're grieving and so they have to need um, support in that way. Or as I was saying before, somebody gets a new diagnosis of um, schizophrenia mm. or bipolar and um, they're affected and so they really need the support, the education. Right and people to advocate for them and sometimes teach them and empower them so they can advocate for themselves. Surely. Yeah, well, it's, now it's in so your important. organization right here at Downstairs, is there a number of people who might be looking at this show could call and not get an appointment so much, but get some more information on your group? Sure. Uh -huh. um, we have a link. Um, there's an email link and there's a telephone number helpline. So the email link is NAMI East Flatbush mm -hmm. at AOL.com. I see. And there is also a helpline, but um, for the most part on our brochures, my number is there, so mm -hmm. they can call 718-270-2537, uh -huh. and I'll direct them to the, the actual helpline. And uh, again, our, our meetings are held first Thursday of mm -hmm. the month oh. for consumers here okay. at Downstate, right. Classroom 1B, mm -hmm. and for family members, the third Thursday of the month at um, Classroom 1B from 6 to 8 p.m. here at 395 Lenox Road. And we also have the second Mondays over at Keynes County for the Spanish-speaking meetings mm -hmm. at 451 um, 
Clarkson Avenue at Keynes County in the Behavioral Health Building, the right. R Building, mm -hmm. on the third floor. Now, mm -hmm. are, are there, um, uh, can students attend these kind of meetings as well? They can. We open it to the general public. We've had the College of New Rochelle bring their students and their professor. They come oh. to sit in as part of their learning, um, of their, you know, learning, which is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, that's mm -hmm. gonna that, that's gonna really open up a lot of channels yeah. just by you being on the show today mm -hmm. to get this hope uh, against dope. <laughs> you know, because a lot of people, when they lose hope, they turn to other things, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's marijuana, or, or, which is now look like it's going to be legalized, and what a trouble we're going to have with that. But all the other drugs that people get into, alcoholism, very important. Uh, and just taking drugs. You know, right, so. people try to self-medicate their pain. That's right, medicate mm -hmm. their pain. That's mm -hmm. not the answer. Listen, Mr. Martin, thank you so much for being with us You're today. You're welcome. And uh, giving us your time, your, all the good information and encouragement of seeing someone come from a, one stage to another stage of thank life. You. So you folks out there, don't stay on the same stage of life. You can step up and become an actor on another stage more positive.